When I was younger, I played a lot of games on the original Nintendo and Super Nintendo consoles. These experiences resonated with my natural curiosity and desire for exploration, allowing me to discover entire worlds created out of simple tiles of pixels and sprites. These worlds brought adventures and told stories that were written line by line on the phosphorescent surface of a humming glass tube. Eventually, I began to wonder how the electronics themselves functioned and how they turned a button press into a character moving forward or into a spell that cast fire into the distance. One day I saw my brother playing Little Nemo with a keyboard and his computer instead of the little rectangle tethered to the two-tone gray box I was used to seeing. I was bewildered to see a gruesome, bloody hand cursor and a vivid blue menu appear as he quickly changed games and loaded up Skate or Die. This was my first introduction to emulators. Recently, I revisited these curiosities and decided to find out how to make my own emulator. I wanted to know how they worked to recreate what seemed like such a unique system, and thinking about it all made me realize how little I understood about the inner workings of the hardware. Not only would I have a better understanding of some of the games I used to play as a kid, I would have a much stronger conceptual understanding of how CPUs work, how computers work, and the deeper workings of assembly and machine code. Lately, I've also been interested in the preservation of the history of these games. Many obscure titles have never been re-released on modern systems, and it seems like they may be fated to rot away bit by bit in their cartridge prisons as their electrical media decays. Emulation breathes new life into some of these games, saving the originals and allowing fans to modify and reinvent some titles that would otherwise be lost to time. This is a contentious topic that quickly becomes intertwined with the discussion of software piracy, in my opinion wrongfully so, but it was something that came to mind as I was working on this project. The Nintendo Entertainment System, or NES, seems like as good of a place to start as any to make an emulator. After all, it's a pretty classic system, it should be simple, right? It turns out that that's not exactly true. Reading through the NES references exposed a large number of unique hardware descriptions, game-specific memory mappers, and very precise timings. Let's talk about Space Invaders instead. Space Invaders was originally released on arcade cabinets in 1978. While not quite as nostalgic for me as some of the later home consoles, Space Invaders has a pretty rich history in both the hardware used and its effect on the game industry and electronics as a whole. Its creator, Tomohiro Nishikado, was inspired by other games and media such as Breakout, Star Wars, and War of the Worlds. He was pulled towards the space theme while trying to come up with enemy designs, finally settling on aliens since the game's publisher Taito found the idea of shooting enemy humans immoral. The game's hardware was based on the Intel 8080. This was the second 8-bit microprocessor ever created by Intel. The CPU started development 50 years ago in 1972, and was released in 1974 as the successor of the first commercially available 8-bit microprocessor, the Intel 8008. The 8008 in turn was the successor to the very first commercially produced microprocessor ever, the 4-bit Intel 4004. These two microprocessors built the foundation for the 8080, which quickly revolutionized the computing industry and redefined how computers were built, pushing the industry towards machines built around modules rather than being built from scratch in vertically integrated structures. Nishikado's Space Invaders is a perfect example of this shift, as he single-handedly designed not just the game, but a custom-made microcomputer using the 8080 to run it. He said that compared to developing the hardware, the rest was easy. The 8080's legacy lives on even on modern desktop PCs, whose processors carry some of its DNA within the commonly used x86 instruction set. The 86 in x86 refers to the 8086, which was a direct 16-bit extension of the 8-bit 8080. All this to say, the heritage of this processor is still carried strongly within devices that many people still use every day. With the target hardware in mind, how do we even begin? Generally, anytime you deal with circuits, the first thing to do is look for a datasheet. And luckily, the datasheet is still available online, complete with a photocopy of a mail-in registration for your brand new microprocessor. This roughly 250-page tome is a comprehensive list of all the details necessary to recreate the chip and software, and we'll need to reference it for every behavior we need to implement. The other resources I used were emulator101.com and the Space Invaders section of computerarchaeology.com. The links are in the description.
Emulator 101 pretty explicitly marks out the path of how to create this emulator, and Computer Archaeology gives us a lot of details on both how the Space Invaders code runs and how the custom hardware works. The last thing we will need will be the game ROM to run. I'm sure there are some legal issues with acquiring ROM files for this game, as it's the intellectual property of Taito, which I found out is a subsidiary of Square Enix while writing this paragraph. I'm not really sure what I expected. Maybe some, like, Pac-Man Final Fantasy crossover or something? I anyway, my copy of the game has files invaders.h, .g, .f, and .e, and are loaded into the computer's memory in that order. As a precursor to the hardware, we'll have to talk about binary and hexadecimal, since they are the language we use to understand and communicate with the system. In everyday life, we use a decimal or base 10 system, where a digit flips when you get to 10. We use other bases as well. Time is based on sexagesimal, or base 60 system, that defines 60 seconds to a minute and 60 minutes to an hour, until it gets separated into either duodecimal with 12-hour sections or... Uh, 24-hour days, depending on if you're thinking in the Babylonian or Egyptian flavor. The, the point is, the flip point where we move to a new column is completely arbitrary and could happen at any number. For base 2, we add a new column when we reach 2. For base 3, we add a new column when we reach 3, and so on. We can build number systems with any base, but the two that are convenient when working with digital logic are binary and hexadecimal. Binary is a base 2 system where the flip happens whenever a digit reaches 2, and we create a new column. This means going from 1 to 2 in binary looks like going from 1 to 1 0. Instead of a 1's place, a 10's place, a 100's place, and so on, with increasing powers of 10, we'll have a 1's place, a 2's place, a 4's place, and so on, with a pattern of increasing powers of 2. For example, the number 6 is 4 plus 2, so we have 1, 1, 0, or 4 plus 2 plus 0, also represented by 0 times 2 to the power of 0, plus 1 times 2 to the power of 1, plus 1 times 2 to the power of 2. If you're writing code in C++, the prefix 0 with a lowercase b tells the compiler and whoever's reading your code that it's a binary number and not the decimal number 110. It's what I'm used to, so I borrowed the notation here. The reason we go through all of this effort to begin with is because our computers are built on binary, and that's mostly due to convenience. It's much easier to measure if a wire is carrying 0 volts or 5 volts and round to the nearest extreme instead of dividing it up and trying to decide whether it's close to some fuzzy in-between. A wire, input, output, or memory circuit can be on or off, high or low, 0 volts or 5 volts, and so on. This gives us a pretty elegant way of mapping hardware to something abstract like a number value. An output of a circuit is now a 1 or a 0 as long as it's within a certain threshold. Hexadecimal is base 16, which means the flip is at 16. But it wouldn't be very clear if we kept using 10, 11, 12, etc. up to 16 to represent a column. This means we need more symbols to account for any number past 9, and in practice, we use A through F to represent 10 to 15. If we use these concepts to build the number CAFE, where the prefix 0x specifies that it's a hex number and not a bunch of letters or some random decimal number, we have 14 groups of 1 added to 15 groups of 16, because this column gets incremented every time we get to 16, added to 10 groups of 256, or 16 squared, added to 12 groups of 4096, or 16 cubed. When adding this all together, it turns out that this is a hexadecimal representation of 51,966. A hexadecimal number is much easier to convert to binary than a decimal number, since each digit is a complete package of four bits. The first digit is the bottom four, the next digit is the next four, and so on. To illustrate, we can convert 21E to binary and then convert its decimal equivalent, 542. This way, it's simple enough to use a table or convert each four bits of hex out to binary in your head and then stack them together. When converting decimal, we need to repeatedly divide by 2 and keep the remainder of each operation. 
The first remainder is the right-hand bit, also called the least significant bit. We take our new number and divide by 2 again, saving its remainder, which gives us the next highest bit. This is repeated until we are left with 0 as our quotient. Hexadecimal's compact representation of binary makes it much more simple to work with when we need to use individual bits later on. With all of our resources found and a basic understanding of the form the information takes, we're ready to talk about the hardware. We get a little bit of an odd view of a system when we emulate one, since parts of the CPU get sort of wrapped together or abstracted out in a sense. We end up with the main pieces of the system to emulate being the CPU registers, the opcodes, the memory, and the peripherals like inputs and outputs. There's a lot of glue and control logic that ends up being a little more trivial when we're not having to lay it out transistor by transistor. Something like a full adder circuit, which as its name implies adds two numbers together, goes from over a dozen or dozens of transistors down to a line of text that says add A plus B. All that being said, let's start with the computer's memory. This is the space where instructions and data are stored. The smallest unit of data is a bit, which can represent either a 0 or a 1. These could be pixel values, electrical signals for button inputs, or any other number of encoded pieces of information. These bits are usually grouped in sets of 8, called bytes, and bytes are often grouped as words, whose size varies based on the computer's architecture. In the case of our 8-bit computer, we usually work with a single byte at a time, and they act as the smallest unit of memory the computer can address and directly act on. This also means we'll see values between 0 and 255, or 0 to FF in hex, a lot. The circuitry the Intel 8080 uses to address these bytes does have a 16-bit register, and can independently select an address from 0 to 65,535, or 0 to FFFF. This memory space tends to be organized into different sections. First, there is read-only memory, or ROM, where the program, in this case Space Invaders, is stored. It's not meant to be changed and holds the instructions for how the game runs. It may be loaded off of a cartridge or other storage medium and copied into memory on startup, or run directly from the cartridge or storage itself. Regardless, this system will expect the first 8 kilobytes of memory to contain the game. As the game runs, it begins to fill the RAM, random access memory, with information about the program. This is where data is stored between calculations and where program state is stored meaning lives, score, sprite coordinates, is the player able to shoot or waiting between shots, stuff like that. Within the RAM, there's a section called the stack. This is where values are placed when the CPU needs to stop what it's doing to process other instructions, but will eventually need to return to an operation it was doing previously. The stack is named this way because data is added to or removed from the top of the stack. These operations are called push and pop, respectively. In order for a byte to be removed from the stack, the values on the top of it must be removed first. I only talk about the stack because there is hardware and instructions that directly deal with this memory structure, and it'll come up in more detail when looking at other parts of the system. After all of this, there is the VRAM, or video RAM, where the information about the display is stored. There's not really too much to say about this. Each bit in this memory space directly represents a pixel on the screen, but rotated 90 degrees. This means that if you read the VRAM bit by bit, you would draw the screen line by line from left to right, with each individual line being drawn from bottom to top. Here's an example from the emulator itself. You can actually track how the data matches with its corresponding sprite animation on screen. This last area is actually unused. Since there are 16 bits of addressable space, this would mean there needs to be 16 wires or traces running to the memory chip or chipset. This can add a lot of headache to the design if you're making custom hardware for a program that doesn't even use that much memory. Instead, there might not actually be circuitry for the upper few bits. As an example, 
if you read from the address 7070, but the top two bits weren't connected to anything, the program would instead give you 3070. This can have the effect of making it look like the RAM is repeating. Basically, once you get past the bound, it repeats back and reads the same addresses again. This is called a mirror, or RAM mirror, not to be confused with memory mirroring, memory mirroring mode, or RAM mirroring mode that actually does create an exact copy of memory for redundancy in case of damage or corruption. A well-behaved program won't read or write to it, but it's still something odd and a little obscure that you run into emulating older systems. Moving on to more of the calculation side, or at least the intermediate space between storage and processing are CPU registers. These registers are small chunks of memory that the CPU has access to for calculation. For the Intel 8080, there are seven 8-bit registers and two 16-bit registers, but the 8-bit registers can often work together as 16-bit registers. The numbers stored within the registers can be added, subtracted, stored to and loaded from memory, or defined memory addresses that can be manipulated in similar ways. All of these behaviors and operations are defined within the CPU instructions. The seven 8-bit registers are called A, B, C, D, E, H, and L. The two 16-bit registers are SP and PC. There's also an 8-bit status register that contains flags for the following conditions. Was the result of the last operation negative? Was the result A0? Did the result trigger an auxiliary or half carry, where the value overflowed the bottom four bits? Was the result even? And did the result trigger a full carry, where the value overflowed past all eight bits? The A register is called the accumulator, and most of the operations directly affect the status of this register by using it in calculation. The B, C, D, and E registers are generally used to store data that will add, subtract, logically compare, etc. to A. B and C, D and E, and H and L are all register pairs that can be each be treated as one 16-bit register for specific calculations. The H and L register pair is often used in instructions that store or load from memory and generally contain the high and low bytes of a memory address, respectively. The SP and PC registers are somewhat special in that they serve more specific purposes than the other registers. The SP register is the stack pointer. It references the current memory address that is at the top of the stack, meaning it keeps track of the address that stores the last value added to that block of memory and RAM we talked about earlier. A push instruction writes a 16-bit value to the stack, storing the high byte to the address one slot before the address stored in the stack pointer, and storing the low byte to the address two slots before the address stored in the stack pointer. The stack pointer is then decremented twice to account for the new number. A pop instruction will move a 16-bit number off of the stack, removing the low byte that is at the current stack pointer address and the corresponding high byte that is one byte after that address. These values get copied to whatever register the specific command is targeting, and the stack pointer gets incremented by two. The PC register is the program counter and keeps track of the current operation the computer is on. It starts at address 0 and is incremented by 1, 2, or 3 bytes depending on the length of the instruction that needs to be executed. Both the SP and PC registers can be modified by specific CPU instructions to be set to a specified value or used in arithmetic operations. So with the context of what data and memory are, and a little background of how the data is moved to the processor in the form of the CPU registers, now it's time to talk about what the computer does with this data. The computer instructions from the perspective of an emulator is sort of a combination of the control unit, combinational logic, and the glue logic that holds everything in between. These instructions are written as numbers that are coded to a specific type of operation and thus called opcodes, and the collection of them is called an instruction set. The opcodes for the Intel 8080, you may be utterly shocked to hear, are written as 8-bit numbers, just like most other data in our system. Each opcode corresponds to a, generally, unique function, falling under one of the categories of data transfer, arithmetic, branching, or 
stack I.O., and machine control, which is all considered its own group in the manual. There are 72 of these commands, if you count each entry in the manual as a separate instruction, and 245 opcodes that implement these commands. An instruction can have many opcodes that each affect different registers, like how the add instruction has eight different opcodes that all add some register to A. Each instruction has a specific number of CPU clock cycles that it needs to run before the command is finished. The Intel 8080 has a clock speed of 2 MHz, which means it can process 2 million of these clock cycles per second. This means that the time it takes in seconds to run an instruction is the cycle duration of that instruction divided by the clock speed, although it's probably more in the realm of microseconds or even nanoseconds than regular old seconds. You can search for Intel 8080 opcodes and find tables listing each instruction. Usually they have the command symbol, cycle duration, command length, and affected flags. All of this information is in the programming manual we saw earlier, and it'll probably take a few visits to the tome to figure out what a lot of these mean. For an example of a command running, when opened in a hex editor, the first three bytes of the Space Invaders ROM are 00. zero. Each of these bytes represents a no-op, or no-operation, instruction denoted as NOP. CPU reads the instruction, takes no action, and continues to the next instruction. We are 12 cycles in and haven't done much. Not very exciting. The next byte is C3. Finding the corresponding entry in the table or in the programming manual tells us that this is a jump command. It takes 10 clock cycles and reads a total of 3 bytes of ROM, which includes the opcode byte itself. This command takes the next two bytes after the opcode, combines them together to create a 16-bit memory address, and places that memory address into the program counter, which will read the byte at that location as the next command. The next two bytes are D4 and 18, which means the value 18D4 gets loaded into the PC register. That may seem odd, as you might expect the address to be D418, but this CPU is little endian, which means the following two bits after the command are the lower byte and higher byte respectively, not the higher byte and then lower byte. If you weren't sure how to order them, the entry in the manual explicitly states how the three bytes are represented in memory as well as how they are combined into the PC register. Despite how fun it is to look up every single value stored in ROM byte by byte to figure out what commands to implement and how the program works like we would in the good old days, for our convenience we will convert the instructions to assembler like the good but slightly less old days. In reality, this emulator doesn't have a true disassembler and only keeps a log of the last run opcodes rather than making a disassembly of the whole file. This turned out to be a mistake on my part and a misunderstanding of how the ROM is written. I wasn't sure what would happen when it hit a part of the ROM that contained data, so I just didn't make one and opted to trace the program as it was running. This makes things much harder, especially since the disassembler isn't that complex to write compared to just writing every opcode and wondering why it doesn't work when things start to glitch out. Both disassemblers and log files are very helpful to understanding the ROM's programming and for debugging the emulator. It's very tedious to dig through the opcodes of a loop that might run the same three commands hundreds of times, and this is where the disassembler saves enormous amounts of time over using log files to understand the code. The disassembly gives you a larger picture view, while the log file gives you an instruction by instruction view. In my defense, I didn't actually need to disassemble the code myself because of how well documented it was, but this was not the case for the next ROM I tried, where I struggled much more without the full disassembled code. Given the architecture we've outlined so far, we have a pretty good way of executing programs, as long as we don't have to react to something. What happens if a set of instructions needs to execute in response to something? In that case, we'll use an interrupt, which usually forces the computer to throw everything onto the stack and work on the task that's asking for its immediate attention. More specifically, on the hardware, there is an interrupt pin that connects to a device that responds to some signal, sensor, or some other thing. It doesn't really matter what it is specifically. The device will pull the pin low when it wants to get the attention of the processor, and the processor will in turn send an acknowledge signal, an INTA in the manual, by pulling the pin low in response. Once the CPU and the device are now ready, the device will send a command to the CPU through its eight data pins, 
This can be any command, but it's almost always a restart command. There are eight restart commands that each bring the program to a restart vector location. Restart 0 is address 0, restart 1 is address 8, restart 2 is hex address 10, all the way to restart 7, which is address 38. Now, none of that actually matters for our purposes. Well, more accurately, only the last part matters, but it does give us more clarity of how this is all supposed to work. For Space Invaders, there are two interrupts that were connected to the scanline circuitry of a CRT. All we need to do is tell the program that when we have just finished drawing the middle line of pixels of the screen, trigger an interrupt that calls Reset 1, and when we have finished drawing the entirety of the screen, call Reset 2. This essentially triggers two subroutines that draw the bottom of the screen and the top of the screen, respectively. We don't want these running before the program is ready for them, though, so the CPU has an interrupt enable bit, I-N-T-E, that is set or reset by the instructions enable interrupt and disable interrupt, respectively. If the interrupt enable bit is reset to zero, all of the corresponding circuitry is disabled and no interrupts can be registered to the CPU. Now we need a way for the system to interact with the user and the environment. The Intel 8080 can address up to 256 input devices and 256 output devices. The in command reads an 8-bit number from the target input device and stores the value into the accumulator, register A. The out command reads the current value stored within register A and sends it to the target output device. Space Invaders uses four of these input addresses as well as five of the output addresses. Some of this information is player input, like move commands and shoot, but some of it is used to add external circuitry that implements a 16-bit shift register into the system. This is how the program made the iconic scroll motion of the invader sprites. Output port 2 used bits 0, 1, and 2 to define the shift amount of the register between a value of 0 and 7. Port 4 contains the actual data that will be shifted into the registers. The shift register takes in two bytes and shifts them as a group to the right. The bottom eight bits of the shift register are then available on input port 3. The inputs 0, 1, and 2 contain the player 1 and 2 controls, as well as the coin sensor for credits and some difficulty settings. The remaining three output ports are related to audio and saving the cabinet in the case of something locking up. They aren't necessary to get the game running, and since the audio was created from analog circuitry, it would take some effort to replicate or you can find the raw audio files to play when the corresponding bit is triggered. After hours of explanations, here's the emulator in action. The graphics are programmed with OpenGL and the menus are made with Deer MGUI. The emulator has a place to watch all of the internal states, which includes the full computer memory, the registers, and a few key memory addresses for coins and inputs. There's also the list of previous opcodes run, the current opcode, and a space for the video display. Saving the memory and register states would allow you to create a save state feature, but that's not present in this bare bones implementation. Some good features to implement for debugging are the abilities to change the clock speed of the emulator, run a single opcode at a time, see memory addresses and registers, keep logs of run opcodes, see the current opcode and description, see the current opcode and context of the program, and pause at different conditions. For pausing, being able to halt at a specific opcode or a specific memory address are usually helpful. The main loop of the program is basically split into running the CPU, displaying the GUI, and getting the inputs. The GUI and inputs are mostly independent and updated in an arbitrary 20 FPS, while the CPU is fixed at the 2 MHz clock cycle. It will run the CPU for one frame worth of clock cycles at a time, then pause until it's time to run the next frame. It was too difficult to run each clock cycle individually, so this was a compromise that still allows the game to play at roughly the intended speed. The interrupts are run every half a frame worth of clock cycles, alternating between the mid-screen and end-screen interrupt. This probably isn't completely cycle accurate to the original, but it's a pretty close approximation, and I haven't noticed any glitches with this implementation. I don't think it would hold up if you were to run a program that used any really precise timings. For my purposes, it's been good enough. The code itself is pretty hacked together. 
I made some shortcuts thinking this was going to be a smaller project, but it ended up biting me at every turn. It's pretty heavily written in a C style, which made debugging strings kind of a pain as well. Finding small edge cases where an instruction mostly works but doesn't trigger a flag correctly, or a byte wasn't properly masked, were some of my main bugs to track down. Bigger issues were more about deciphering information to understand what the implementation was meant to look like. The interrupt service routine in particular ended up causing me to rewrite my whole method of handling timing and clock cycles. I'm going to end this here, since this is a long video and the information is pretty dense. This was my first attempt at making anything like this, so apologies if it's a little rough and some of the information is unclear or a little bloated. I don't spend very much time on the code either, but there should be enough information and resources to muddle through some of the other details if you're interested in building an emulator yourself. At the very least, I hope you found this interesting, if not informative. Thank you so much for watching.